Good morning. Good morning. Again, for the 20th time, that was very impressive. So impressive, I want to hear it again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's fantastic. 20 times I've been on the stage saying good morning. And I do think we're making progress. I think we're getting further developed in ourselves as a profession. We're learning more and more each time. And the purpose of coming together today in June, to follow up on January, is to really start being critical of ourselves and saying, where are we in our development as a profession, individually, in what we're trying to do to help ourselves grow, to learn more, to do a better job in L&D? It's a great opportunity to be here. So thank you very much for coming along. My name, of course, is, is Don Taylor, and uh, I'm your, well, I was going to say I'm your chairman, but somebody said to me, actually, Don, what you are is you're the host, which is sort of true. I'm more of a host than anything else. I'd like to say welcome to come in, and I'd like to encourage everybody, like a host at a party, to have a good time to network, to chat, to have conversations and, and to share. Because although I start off saying we need to be thinking about how we can continue to grow as a profession, the best way we can do that is to share our aspirations and our issues with, with each other and to develop and get well, some hints and some help from each other. Now, I'm going to, as usual, do a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to ask a very important question and then I'll introduce our keynote speaker and we can start the day off. Housekeeping. Very important, everyone's got a badge, and the badge has got your sessions, of course, mine says organizer's staff, so it doesn't have my sessions on it, but yours does have your sessions on it, and it says the sessions which you registered to come on to. So if you're, was I not mic'd up before that? Well, if, could you just turn the mic off, Mark, for a second? If I had known that I wasn't properly mic'd up beforehand, <laughs> Obviously, I would have spoken like this, but I think the people in the front row would have got either very wet or very deaf. So let's have the mic back up. Okay, thank you. Uh, when we are getting mic'd up earlier on, actually, it was very interesting. Mark said to me, uh, yeah, Don, with, with you, we always have to turn the levels down a bit because you are a bit loud. That's not a bad thing, is it? Okay, so we have our badges, and the badges say what sessions we're on, and that's in white on black at the top. Uh, there's also, very importantly, um, your refreshment voucher. I like that, not a food voucher or a drink voucher, a refreshment voucher, so that you can use that to get refreshed. I think it amounts to eight pounds, so basically, that, basically that's lunch. And there are a couple of um, dedicated tea and coffee stations out in the foyer, which are for people here who are at the conference to go and get free teas and coffees at. Okay, so free teas and coffees, and your lunch, and of course, as well as the conference, during breaks, and particularly during the one and a half hour lunch, we've got the exhibition which takes place just through there. Something like 33 different exhibitors, I think, showing the latest in learning technologies. So it's like a sort of small January event, but um, slightly more concentrated, and all on one floor, which is nice. Okay, can I just ask a question? Who actually came in January to the Learning Technologies Conference? That's fantastic. So that shows that we're, what we're trying to achieve is a sort of continuity, and that's, that's working. Fantastic. Right, that's my housekeeping done. I'm going to move on to that important question now. You know what's going to happen next if you're here in January. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you to discuss it. So if there's anybody right now who's sitting by themselves, get ready to shuffle over to talk to somebody else. Everyone's looking around nervously now, because if you're sat between two people, is it rude not to go to that person? What do I do? I've introduced a whole new social dilemma. It's terrible. Um, the question I'd like to ask is, bearing in mind that what I said about January through June, where we want to get to is, just think for a moment, don't speak for a second, but just think for a moment, what were your aims and your aspirations in January? Where were you hoping to get to? Just, just think about that for a second. Don't you have to talk? Okay, that, that was what you were hoping to do. You were hoping to do something in January. And the trouble is, if I start speaking loudly again, the mic's going to come on. Are we back on? Yes, okay. Now, that's what you wanted to get to in January. How far are you on your journey to get there? That's the question. I'd like to think about that for a second. And now, turn to your neighbour and explain to them how far have you got on your journey to where you wanted to get to in January? Where have you succeeded? 
where have you had some challenges that you'd like to overcome? Okay, how far you are you on your journey? Two minutes, go ahead. This, this poor pen <coughs> carries the scars of trying to stop learning and development people talking. It's, it's a battered implement, but it, it carries on boldly doing its job. Right, very quickly, very quickly, who would like to share where they are, what the challenges are, and, and can we help you out? Any, you did, was that you just brushing your hair? Uh, <laughs> suddenly, no. <laughs> Any thoughts? Who wants to share? Yeah. It's how do, we, how do we not let the technology drive the agenda? How do we not make it do? Uh, how do we not start running after it? How do we not, as I put it, let the procedural tail wag the pedagogical dog? So we want to do what we want to do and get the tools to serve us, not the other way around. What's the industry you're in, traditional industry? Railways. Railways. Uh, that, that's sounding really damn big. <laughs> right, we're going to have a little vo vocal exercise here. We're going to say railway in a downbeat voice. And then we're going to say it in an upbeat voice. So let's say railway, railway. And now be positive. How do you say railway positive? Railway. <laughs> and that's how we should all think about where we work. <laughs> railway. Railway's great. Yay. <laughs> OK, one last, any, any last thought we want to share? I, love, I think that's a really good point. Let's not let technology drive the agenda. Any other thoughts? Oh, you're putting glasses on. Peripheral vision, I saw a hand going up, but it was glasses. Nobody else want to share? Go on. From order takers. I think you two guys should come up with a double act for me, because actually that's, that's two of the things that really drive me. It's this business of, of not letting technology drive it and not being the order takers, but really engaging with the business. How far are you on the journey? It's, it's early steps, but it's, it's for the for us, it's, uh, it's a steady step. It's, it's really an easy step. Great. OK, so just very quickly, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm taking up our keynote's time here, but I'm fascinated by the answer here. What has worked in moving from being an order taker to being more engaged? What's, what, if you had to share one thing with everybody else, what would it be? Oh, I love it. It is that simple. Ask questions and just say no. <laughs> right, actually, we should do that. Let's just say no. One, two, three. No. Uh, not very positive way to start the conference. <laughs> but take that with you when we go back to work and remind ourselves that we don't have to take the orders. We can have the conversations, understand the business, not let technology drive it, and get further down the route. Thank you. Great answers. Time for me. I mean, I could do this all day long, but you're probably waiting now for our keynote speaker. So am I. We had, uh, I had a great uh, chance to catch up with him last night, and I learned a great number of things about it. It's always a bit, a bit uh, sort of awe-inspiring when you meet people who've written a great book that you've read, and turn out not only to have done that and lots of other things, but to have done lots of other completely unrelated things in their lives, like being a top marathon runner and being a great musician. Uh, and you think to yourself, well, gosh, how, how do I go around packing all that in? I don't know what the answer is. But I do know that our keynote speaker today is somebody who's achieved a lot in his life and is very keen on sharing it and particularly sees an, a vision of the future which is very different to how we are now and it's sort of snuck up on us and it's largely a result of the openness of communication and in particular of the vast amount of information and knowledge that's now open to us. His book that he'll tell you about uh, as he kicks off, it's called Open, and I'm delighted to have him with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Price. David, thank you. Thanks, Guy. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Oh, God, you are a lively crowd. Don also said you were a smart crowd, so I'm going to be going at a fair old lick, uh, but he said that's okay. Uh, and I presume you can all understand the accent. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, sorry, before we start, can you just say disintermediation? 
Dis- Why? <laughs> all right. Disintermedi- <clears throat> Excuse me. Disintermediation. All right. I could listen to that all day in a Geordie accent, honestly. <laughs> well, I'll be saying it quite a bit as it <laughs> happens. Um, so I'm going to talk about the issues that are raised in the book. Um, it, uh, and I'm a highly original way of uh, structuring this talk. It's really going to be in three parts. First bit's about how we work, second bit's about how we live, and the third we'll look at the implications for learning. Uh, I'm conscious that there's probably not that many people have actually read the book, so I'm going to kick off with just a a two, three minute video which kind of summarizes the main issues. Over the past 10 years, there's been a profound shift in the way we communicate and collaborate with each other. We see it in billion dollar corporations and in the Arab Spring protest movements in self-help forums in America and among rural farmers in Africa, in global campaign groups like Occupy, and in local community collectives. We're seeing knowledge shift from being something that used to trickle down from expert to novice, but now it's spread through peer-to-peer networks. Knowledge used to be closely guarded, now it's common property. Companies used to disclose knowledge on a need-to-know basis, now the smarter ones don't have any secrets. Instead, they practice radical transparency. And the places where we used to acquire knowledge, schools, colleges, or libraries, are facing an uncertain future because learning is now borderless. We learn on forums, through Twitter, Facebook, and meetups, and it doesn't matter if we're face-to-face or on the opposite sides of the world. And it's not just knowledge we're exchanging. The new sharing economy means we now swap, trade, or pool stuff we use, and the stuff we don't, at a scale that was unimaginable a few years ago. In other words, we're realizing that we don't need the organizations that used to do all this for us. The technical name for this is disintermediation. We're cutting out the middlemen in almost everything we do and dealing directly with each other. Going open has crept up on us, so we've not yet seen it for the global social movement that it's become. Going open is restoring our belief in each other, and it's helping us retake more control of our lives, improving our neighborhoods, or challenging foreign dictatorships. It's driven by a set of values and attitudes that make us feel better about each other, allowing us to rediscover trust, generosity, and empathy. But it's not all good news. The open movement has really taken off in the places where we socialize. In the places where we work and study, however, more of us are becoming disengaged. We're switching off because the openness and autonomy that we've come to expect socially is missing in all but the most innovative companies and colleges. Going open is irreversible. Now that we have more control over how we live, we're not likely to hand that power back. So it's not a question of whether our schools and workplaces become open, but when, and how we help them do it. So I realize that that goes quite quickly. Don't worry, I'm going to cover most of the issues. Um, In a nutshell, the the reason for writing the book was because I saw, uh, as Don said, a a number of things which seemed to me were sneaking up on us. And to go to a colleague's uh, point about technology, for me, it wasn't so much the technology, but what the technology has enabled to happen, which are a bunch of values like transparency, sharing, self-determinism, which weren't available probably even 10 years ago. Uh, And we now take this so much for granted as part of our daily lives that we probably don't even notice it. The, the urgency for me in writing the book was that it's, it's having a profound effect on our modalities of learning, things like the rise of informality, uh, the rise of non-linear learning, all the things that we kind of were told weren't good for us or weren't the kind of the best way to learn. And it's, it's profoundly challenging those. And for me, the question is, um, the gap between how we learn socially and informally and, the, and how we learn in a formal context, and my background's education, but I, but I also include lots of business examples in the book, and I include work-based learning as part of that formal context. I think we're starting to see that gap dangerously widen. Um, and these are really highly disruptive forces. I just want to share with you the, the moment when, for me, the kind of penny dropped and I realized there was something significant. And it's, a, it's an odd place for this to happen. But in 2005, which as we know on these days is an eternity ago, but in 2005 I took both my sons to the Walmart Music Festival. And it was the first time they'd been to anything like this. So I was curious to see what they would be attracted towards, what would, what would get them excited. Uh, And the thing that my eldest son, Jack, who was about 14 at the time, 
thing that he really got excited about were a bunch of guys from Mongolia who specialised in a thing called Tuvan throat singing. Anybody ever heard any Tuvan, it's also called overtone singing? No? Put your hand up if you have a few. Well, it's the most remarkable thing you will ever hear because it's, it's the human voice producing two musical notes simultaneously. So there's this low guttural sound, which sounds like it's been squeezed out the diaphragm, and then on top of it, this high kind of very sweet overtone. So that was the thing that Jack had found really fascinating. And then three weeks later, he came around to see me, and he said, hey, Dad, listen to this. And he went, and then produced this amazing overtone on top of it. Sorry, that really hurt my throat. <laughs> um, and I said, how on earth have you managed to do that? This was only three weeks after the festival. I said, you know, you haven't spent 15 years in the Mongolian desert. You haven't been herding yak and living off goat's cheese and living in a yurt. How have you done it? He said, oh, some English guy did that a few years ago. And then he put it up as a bunch of online learning modules. And I've taught myself how to do it. And it wasn't just one style of this overtone. He'd done seven or eight. There's tons of overtone uh, style singing. And I thought, so we've gone from 15 years of enculturation in learning to three weeks. And this was very early days in terms of online learning modules. It was fairly crude. But I thought there's something really powerful about this. What made it even more powerful was at the time, in his music lessons at school, Jack was, and I kid you not, he was colouring in the sections of the orchestra on a worksheet. And I thought, he must be really bored doing that when he's teaching himself how to do Tuvan throat singing, which is technically very demanding. So it seemed to me that there was something really significant. So then I started researching and I looked at how uh, we work. And, and the thing that struck me um, in both uh, schools and colleges, as well as the workplace, is that we are, we are witnessing uh, an epidemic, it seems to me, of disengagement. Um, <clears throat> you've, I'm sure you've all... I'm sure you've all heard the joke about the CEO when he was asked how many people worked in his organisation, he said about half. Um, I think that was probably an overestimate because if you look at the stats, they're quite shocking. I, I used to think disengagement in schooling was bad, but according to the latest Gallup survey, disengagement, uh, the number of engaged employees are set to be around about 13% worldwide. So that's a pretty shocking statistic. The good news is it's gone up from 11%. Um, but actually, when you start to look at what that means in terms of cost, $300 billion to the American economy, the, the cost of disengagement, $26 billion a year in the UK, that disengaged employees are three times more likely to be off sick and nine times more likely to leave. We've clearly got a major issue with disengagement. But when I was talking to L&D people, it seemed to me that they were struggling to get their bosses to take it seriously. And the smart organizations clearly get it. This graph shows on the left the kind of world-class innovative organizations that have got 67% of the workforce who would claim to be engaged, and the average organization that has about 33%. So it's, it's obvious that the Googles of this world uh, get it. But what I can't understand is why more CEOs don't get the connection between engagement, innovation, and productivity. Engaged workers, 20 times more likely to be creative at work. And there's this direct correlation between engagement and innovation. It's been proven by a number of studies. So that, to me, is mystifying why more people are not taking engagement more seriously. And I think there are a number of factors which are affecting uh, this rise in disengagement around the world. The first is, uh, is a loss of autonomy. 40 years ago, um, we had twice as much autonomy, twice as much permission to think as we do now. Um, and this isn't just the kind of low-level call centre workers who are working off a script. I cite an example in the book where I went to see my doctor and she was working to a script. So fairly senior professions are now increasingly working to a script. So loss of autonomy is clearly a big driver. Loss of trust. 90% of employees believe trust is eroded in the past five years. And then, of course, the big one, the loss of job security. And this is really the, 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 the critical issue uh, And when we get into to Don's favourite word. Because it seems to me that the latest uh, research is showing that in the US, it, by just six years' time, 
50% of the workforce is going to be freelance. Not always through choice, but they are having to, having to work freelance. This, this is also the case in Australia, similar kind of research being done, similar kind of statistic. Around 50% of us are going to be working freelance. And one of the big reasons for this massive upheaval in the way that we work is this word disintermediation. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, and what I've seen since I've written the book is that it's affecting everywhere. We've seen it affect the banking industry through PayPal, through peer-to-peer -peer lending services, through uh, um, self-managed online trading. We've seen the music industry almost collapse and have to reconstitute itself once we got things like iTunes and YouTube. So we're seeing it in all levels. Even last week, I don't know if you noticed the story about London taxi drivers are up in arms because of the Uber app. So that process of disintermediation, it seems to me, has many pros and, and a number of cons. The pros, of course, are that it's putting us in direct link with whether that's a recording artist or the industry that we want to have the connection with. We have a closer connection and therefore we're more in control of our lives. But of course the downside is, is that it's having a catastrophic effect upon jobs. And particularly of the, in, over the last few years, jobs in the knowledge economy. This is why it matters to everybody in this room. So, hands up, who remembers the knowledge revolution? Yeah, that's because it didn't happen. We were told it was going to happen. Tony Blair, 1997, said uh, famously his three priorities were education, 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 because we had to be ready for the knowledge revolution. That's another thing he got wrong. We won't get into the others. Um, what actually happened was that no one foresaw that the economic value of knowledge was going to plummet. But the really exciting part for me is that the social value of knowledge has soared. And this is why I, I think it, it's going to change uh, our modalities of learning. We were told that content would be king. I remember in, when I was working in Liverpool at the time, people were saying, you know, the pipes in the ground, there's going to be no money in that. The money's all in the content. What no one predicted was that we, ourselves, citizens, would produce that content as well as the experts who were supposed to do it. So the value of that content plummeted. It was, we were quite happy to do it for nothing. We did also didn't foresee this flood of graduates coming from Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and the effect that that was going to have. So I believe that for the first time, we are probably facing a point where that maxim, that learning is earning, in other words, if you get a degree, it will, it will be worth it over the course of your earned income over the rest of your life, because you'll earn significantly more than people who don't have a degree. I think we're at the point where that is now questionable. Um, and I think that's a myth which needs to be taken on. W Philip Brown has written a book uh, which talks about the high skills, low income future. That our graduates are going to need that degree, but they can't expect to be earning anything like the levels um, of salary that they used to earn in the past because of the, the global competition and what he calls the auction for skills. And it's a kind of Dutch auction. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this, so I won't spend a great deal of time on it. But it isn't like eBay where the price goes up when you're bidding for those skills. The price actually comes down. And, and Paul Sappho has said that the greatest challenge we face over the next 30 years is figuring out what's going to replace the job. If, you, if you're not familiar with these kind of knowledge process outsourcing sites, um, I would strongly recommend that you visit them. Has anybody been on, on elance.com? A few people. Well, this is when, when I saw this, and my sons, when they finished school and didn't and chose not to go to university because um, they're work, working in IT, uh, and the unemployment rate for IT graduates is currently around 70%. So they said, what's the point? We need to pitch for work, and we're going to pitch on places like Elance. I looked at it, and I was astonished. This example that I've pulled up here is just one at random. It was effectively um, a restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia, which needed a business plan. So it, instead of going to the local legal firm and, and there would be somebody whose job it was to write business plans, they put it up on Elance. And the consultancy in America said, yeah, we can do that job. We can do it for $110 an hour. Two consultancies from India with PhD graduates working for them said, yeah, we can do that job. We'll do it for $10 an hour. 
So who are you going to employ everything else being equal? Now, that's the point. We have to make sure that everything else isn't equal. And my son started on, on these websites pitching for work at $5 an hour. He's now up to about $15 an hour because he brings a set of skills that he has developed and taught himself that give him an advantage. But in all our businesses, we have to think about the fact that more and more jobs are being chopped up and sold to the lowest bidder. So disintermediation has some really positive effects and some negative effects. So I want to pause at this point and ask you to turn to the person, since you've already started having these conversations, turn to the person next to you and ask this question. How is disengagement and disintermediation changing the role of learning and development? What does it mean for you guys in the room, the fact that we've got more disengagement and we're now living with disintermediation? Two minutes and then share your thinking. Okay, I don't have Don's little dinger, but I've got an even louder voice. So, I don't know if much of this was news to you, I suspect it's not, but how do you think it's affecting your role in, in your companies? Who'd like to suggest something? Yeah. Absolutely. Anything else? Did everybody hear that, by the way? Sorry. It, it was a question about um, we're, we're still delivering courses when we know that informal learning is the way forward, really. And it's about re educating uh, uh, bosses, really. Yes? So you think it's working? Yeah, I think it is working. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of positives about disintermediation. Um, you know, gone are the days when a musician had to go to a record company and get a contract if they wanted to get to their audience. Now they can just do it directly. So there are some real positives about all of that. And I want to move into really how it's affecting how we live our lives. Because I'd just like you to put your hand up if in the past week you have used social media or YouTube to share any, or, or, to, or to glean any knowledge from other people. Just put your hand up if in the past week. Yeah. I thought that would be the case. I mean, I'd be worried if you hadn't, to be honest, given your jobs. But it's also true outside uh, of this hall. People are doing this, and we're doing it in ways which are now so almost unconscious it's just part of the way that we live our lives. But they have really dramatic effects. Um, just before Christmas, I was in New Delhi, and I played golf with this young fella. His name's Shubham Jagpal. Um, he's now nine. He was eight at the time. Came up to about here on me. Um, and uh, I had a game of golf, and I'm a reasonable golfer. Uh, I play off about 14 handicaps, so average. He beat me by about 10 shots. It was probably the most humiliating day I've ever had on a golf course. But he was a very nice guy, and I was talking to him, and I said, so you're a pretty good player. Um, I said, have you ever entered any kind of tournaments? And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, in fact, I was playing in one uh, just last week. I said, oh, where was it? He said, it was in San Diego. I said, oh, uh, what was it? He said, it was the under 12 world championships. <laughs> and I said, and how did you get on? He said, I won. So immediately, I didn't feel so bad. Uh, but I said, wow, that's amazing. So how long have you been playing golf? So he's eight year old when he won this. And he said, um, well, actually, only on a golf course for two years. He said, but I've been hitting a golf ball for four years. And I said, well, how did that work? He said, well, 
I come from a, a, a remote village. He said, it wasn't in, in New Delhi, it was way out in the country. He said, but we had a, an internet connection. He said, and I taught myself how to play golf by watching YouTube videos of Tiger Woods. Still hasn't had a lesson. And he's become the world champion in his age range uh, without ever having had a lesson, without even going on a golf course until two years ago. So that's just an example of the way in which we're kind of learning ourselves through social media. Have you, anybody come across this guy? His name's Jack Andraka. Uh, he was 15 year old when this photograph was taken. This is him talking at uh, TED. Um, Jack, when he was 15, his uh, uncle died of pancreatic cancer and he's a keen scientist at school. So he started on a school project, which was to come up with a biomarker for pancreatic cancer. And Jack has managed to come up with something which is faster, more reliable, and a thousand times cheaper than the version that's available on the marketplace currently. It's about to go into production. But the interesting thing is, when Jack wrote to 200 universities in America, and he said, I'd like to use some lab space, 198 of them refused. They said, you're a 15-year-old kid. What could you possibly know about pancreatic cancer? Jack did all the research for this uh, amazing achievement using what he calls the teenager's two best friends, Google and Wikipedia. And that was all that he used. Quite astonishing, but even more astonishing is the fact that no one believed that a 15-year-old kid could actually come up with something which has been a, a scientific breakthrough. So that got me thinking about how we're all learning socially. And it's not about, I believe it's not about the technology. There's something about the fact that the technology allows us to reconnect with some values. And I think it's the values that drive our motivation. So I started looking at what, what are those motivations that we get socially and how can we then bring them into the workplace in terms of work-based learning. So I want to share them with you very quickly. There are six of them. The first one is do it yourself. There's a sense of autonomy about social learning, which is really powerful. Clay Shirky talked about we would all share stuff, but that further down the line, we'd start to collaborate and take action. Well, further down the line's already happened. We're taking action in ways that we could never have imagined a few years ago. Three years ago, I came across this website. It's a forum. Uh, it's called beyond.ca, and it's a forum for um, performance car geeks. So I knew nothing about performance car geeks, but my son said, you need to get on there. There's an interesting story breaking. And what had happened was a car dealer in Calgary, the forum's kind of based in Calgary uh, in, in, America, in Canada, um, but it's, it's got a global membership. This car dealer had uh, let a car, this car, a Nissan Skyline, out for a test drive. Um, kid who took it out was about 22, 23 years of age. <laughs> Uh, and the guy notified the police. He gave false ID, of course. Guy notified the police, but wasn't terribly uh, hopeful of getting a car back. Apparently, what happens with performance cars is you've got about 36 hours to get it back. After that, it's been stripped down for parts and it's all been sold. So he puts up this description of the guy and just says, I'm, I'm willing to offer a reward. He says he's a heavy set uh, kid, and his distinguishing feature is he's missing the two middle digits of his left hand. Um, so he makes the rock salute whether he wants to or not. So puts this up and with fairly low expectation. About four hours later, one of the moderators on the forum is driving around Calgary and sees the car, pulls up alongside it on the lights, whips out the mobile phone, takes a photograph and says, hey, I found him. Tries to chase him, but the car gets away. So that then starts a whole chain of events. I don't know if you've go on any forums, but there is this thing, the Photoshop meme, which is whenever you put a photograph up, People will then get the Photoshop out and start to mess about with them. Most of these are too kind of crude and obscene to show you what they do, but eventually this kid becomes known for fairly obvious reasons as the claw. And it starts to become quite a story. By the time this story's finished, a million and a half people have, have, have visited the forum and 4,000 people have posted. So we're now into about six hours. And people say, you know, I think I recognize this kid. I'm sure he went to Father Lakeham High School. So why don't we get on the Facebook page? Well, they do. And then it's only a matter of time before they go, there he is. His name's James Jacobson. So it's only a matter of 20 minutes later when they go, well, actually, this is where he works, and this is where he lives. 
So there's now hysteria is running at fever pitch. And they kind of go, well, look, why don't we just go around there? So they go, let's, let's meet at the local garage, and then we'll work out what we're going to do. Just shout out beyond so we know who you are. They have no idea how many people are going to turn up. In the event, about 20 people turn up. And they go, well, what do we do now? And they said, well, why don't we just drive around to his house? We know where he lives. So they do. And then they block his car in. And then they ring the police. And they say, I believe you've got a stolen car. The police say, have we? And they say, well, yeah, if you want to come round, the guy's still in bed. It's like two o'clock in the afternoon. The guy's in bed. Why don't you come around and arrest him? Which is exactly what happens. The police come around. Um, they arrest him. And of course, the guy's sitting in the car from beyond, whip out the phones, video the whole thing. And less than an hour later, it's up on YouTube. Uh, and this claw has now become notorious around the world. So the car dealer gets his car back, and it's, it's just about 24 hours since it was taken, and the car is in mint condition, absolutely perfect condition. Better than that, the claw has left his baseball cap on the back seat of the car. So what does the car dealer do? He puts it up on eBay. <laughs> and he gets $255 for it. So he's actually up on the deal. Now, when this, when this story broke on Canadian TV, they interviewed the Canadian police and they said, oh, you know, we really don't approve of people taking the law into their own hands like this. But that's the whole point. We do this stuff now because we can, because we can share information quicker than our formal institutions can. Now, that in itself would have been a pretty amazing story, but then something really weird happened. I was talking at a conference about three weeks after I'd heard this story, um, and unbeknownst to me, it was videoed and then put up on YouTube. I get an email from the guy who runs this forum who says, I think you might want to go back on the forum. So I went back on, and what do I see but this? <laughs> so the whole thing starts all over again. They all go, well, who is this guy? He doesn't sound like he's got a Canadian accent. Where did he learn about the story? And then I'm thinking, what's the etiquette here? And I said to my son, what should I do? He said, just look, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see what happens. So, of course... Within a matter of about an hour, somebody says, I found him. <laughs> Here's his Wikipedia page. He's Sir David Price, born 1924, a British Conservative Party politician who was educated at Eton College with this accent. <laughs> so, <laughs> clearly, going to Wikipedia is not your only source of information. But I thought, what do I do? And I, t I just left it. And then somebody then went, do you know he looks pretty good for 86? <laughs> so it's just one example of many, many uh, where we are taking control of our lives and we're using that knowledge, we're sharing it to take action. So autonomy is a really powerful motivator. But so is immediacy. I say do it now because what we see when we look at social learning is this sense of immediacy is really powerful. We all get it. When we tweet something and we get an immediate response, we know what that's like. There's actually neuroscientists have discovered there's a little dop dopamine hit that we get in our brains when we get that fast response. John Seeley Brown talks about the surfing community as one of the great learning communities, and it is. I've studied surfers, the way that they learn. And he talks about four guys in Hawaii who became world champion stunt surfers, and they did it through videoing everything that they did and also looking at associated disciplines like skateboarding. Every day they went out with a video camera and they would share what they'd got, put it up on YouTube. And they were saying that it's now within the surfing community, it takes about 36 hours from a new move being invented to having gone all around the world. And people off beaches all around the world are now copying these moves. Now that's a really powerful driver for learning. And I would suggest that that sense of immediacy is missing from many of our workplaces. So that's number two. Number three, do it with friends. It's a myth that the internet was going to send us all into our bedrooms. We still want to meet with people. We, want, we know that study groups are a powerful way of learning. So these people here in this photograph are in Beijing. They're doing a MOOC. Uh, it's one of Coursera's MOOCs. 160,000 people do it. Of course, it can be completed alone. But every Friday morning, they get together in this coffee shop in Beijing and they share what they've been learning. We still want to do that. 
I don't know if any of you have been on the website meetup.com, but its sole function is to allow people to meet face to face all around the world. And it helps facilitate 50,000 meetings a week in various places. And when I discovered it, I thought, I'll pick something really obscure. So I typed in drunken philosophers. And dozens of drunken, drunken philosophy groups came up. I was astonished. There's even one in Raffles Hotel in Singapore. They get drunk and they talk about philosophy. <laughs> now, we've always had drunken philosophers. Paris was full of them in the 19th century, but they were the intellectual elite. They were a little clique. Now, anybody can get drunk and talk about philosophy. <laughs> so there is a sense of democratization and a sense of collegiality, which is really powerful in terms of social learning. Number four, do it for fun, playfulness. Here's a little video, I'll just play you the first minute of it. It's kind of self-explanatory. Good morning. It's six o'clock. A rather unusual project is starting today. Computer programmers or hackers from Facebook, Google and Amazon are spending the next three days brainstorming in London. Game Jam is a chance for everybody to get together and have creative ideas about how to help advance the cure for cancer. Give up your weekend, how incredible is that? People are giving up their whole weekend and to take our gene data, wrap it up in an engaging way and make it into a game. We're going to get the eyes of the world onto our data and hopefully accelerate cures for cancer. Here the real pressure is you run the clock. Big challenge, you know, the deep ends. It's a really tough problem. And the idea of trying to contribute to curing cancer is incredibly compelling, so that's why I'm here. We're in a strange position as scientists. We've got really good at collecting information about the world, but we're not very good at analysing that data, at turning that data into knowledge. So we've been given some data by Cancer Research. Rather complicated genetic data. This is the challenging thing for the games. They have to keep the data in the kind of original format so that it doesn't break the analysis, but also make a fun game. We're either going to have some sort of crazy granny vigilante out, you know, saving the world from injustice, or possibly, you know, mining asteroids for space fuel. So you're going to have to guess where the changes in the chromosome are. And by doing that, you map all the peaks and the troughs, the important information that then goes back to the scientists. And that will hopefully, over sort of a larger scale, give us a quite, quite a good average of where these, the, these little points that we're looking for are. So this was sponsored by Cancer Research. Um, uh, over a weekend, a bunch of hackers got together and they needed to find a way to accumulate all the world's computing power to help them solve some of these intractable problems around cancer. But they did it through creating this fun game. And it goes to what Seymour Papert, uh, the learning theorist, has talked about hard fun. When he talks about engagement, we always think about engagement, particularly in schools, as, well, it needs to be fun. But he says you need to have challenge alongside the fun. And this was clearly a vexing problem. They put it out there, and they've now got thousands of people in the UK who are playing this game. Uh, it's, I know you've got a session on, on, on gaming uh, and how it can stimulate learning. I think we've massively underestimated the power of gaming. We talk about resilience in learners. And when you see kids, you know, 14-year-old, and they're stuck on level three or four on whatever it is, World of Warcraft, and they spend 12 hours trying to get the level five, you know, don't tell me these kids aren't resilient. We just haven't given them the right kinds of challenges. But that sense of playfulness is all over social learning. But it's also allied to the next motivator, which is a sense of generosity. Um, and since we've just been talking about cancer, I just want to share this story. You won't be able to see this very well from the back, but this was posted quite recently, um, and it was a, a guy in America, and uh, this is a photograph of his mother, uh, and she's extremely sick with cancer. She subsequently died, and this was the last photograph that was taken. And he said, we've still got the oxygen cannula on her face, and he said, I'd really like it if there's anybody out there who could perhaps clean it up so that you know, I can remember my mother the way that I want to remember her. And honestly, there's dozens and dozens of people got the Photoshop out. Um, this, was his, this was his post, and they got the Photoshop out, and then they cleaned up the picture so that, uh, sorry, so that she's now seen without the cannula. 
Uh, it was a really touching sense of a desire of a community to help. This guy was absolutely gobsmacked. I don't know if you can see here, though, in the photograph that's cleaned up, they haven't noticed, but the chair's got a scuff mark on it. So someone else said, oh, I can clean that up for you. And that's what they did. It's a really lovely story in that sense of generosity, which is driving a lot of stuff on the internet. Of course, we hear ab about all the bad stuff. What we don't hear are the millions of random acts of kindness which take place through social learning. So here's the last one, and probably the most powerful of all. Do it for the world to see. The notion of high visibility. I've recently been in contact with a woman called Helen Bevan, whose job is, I think her job title is Director of Transformation for the NHS. Now that's a job title. 1.7 million employees, the largest employee in the country, and she's having to transform it. And she was telling me that the biggest challenge that she faced was that all the people who worked in the NHS felt like they needed permission before they could change what they were doing. And her job is to turn that on its head, to get change happening from the ground up. So what she's done, two amazing things. One thing is what she calls change day in the NHS. It's now in its second iteration. It happens on the 31st of March, and it just asks people who work in the NHS to make a pledge about something that they'll change in the practice. Some of them are big pledges, some of them are small. But she had 800,000 pledges made over the course of a day. Now, that's massive engagement. There probably was a time when the NHS used to have a suggestions box, but it wouldn't hold 800,000 suggestions. So she's now taken it into the next stage, which is to say, OK, if we've mobilised all these people and they, every pledge that they make is publicly available, anyone can see it, she then said, well, how can we actually turn that action into learning? So she's created this school, the, the School of Health and Care Radicals, and she's asked people to create their own online um, tutorials which is then promoted through all the usual social media. This is a massive change for the NHS, but it's been incredibly powerful, and I believe it's powerful because we, we are putting our learning out there so everyone can see it. And I was telling Don last night of an example of something where people are putting their worst practice online so that their peers can help solve it. Putting your best practice up doesn't help anybody. But putting the things that go wrong, well, that's a different matter. And when we've got trust in our learning community to be able to do that, then we're really into some powerful learning. So here's the next question I want to ask you guys. Same thing, just spend a couple of minutes. Reflect on your own learning spaces and just chat to the person next to you about how many of these motivations, how many of these drivers do you think are apparent in your learning spaces? Okay. So we've got some microphones now so we can actually hear. Don't let that put you off, though. Um, remember, we're reflecting on that dramatic increase in, in social learning and the things that are driving it. Let's have some examples of where you think some of those motivations are in your learning spaces. Who'd like to go? Yes, there's a gentleman there. Yeah. So that sense of collegiality, there's a sense of immediacy as well, which has been developed through that. Great example. Yeah. Ex exactly. You know, when the, the famous Eureka project happened at Xerox, they thought to get those engineers to share their top tips, they'd have to pay them. So they offered them $25. And the engineer said, we don't want your money. We just want the kind of recognition of our peers. Let's have another example. David, up, up at the back. Please. Yep. Oh, sorry, down the front. We've got, some... well, we've got one down the front, and then we can perhaps take one more up at the back. Hi. Um, just very quickly, then. After the, I've just been on the second um, iteration of something called Facilitation Jam, 
which is basically, I mean, we're not looking for cures for cancer, but we're looking for ways to get together, share good practice, improve it, hone it, take risks. And I think a lot of what goes on in that environment needs um, trust, generosity, playfulness, and that kind of thing. It's not very high visibility. I, I, um, I think we, we probably do too good a job of keeping it a secret. But it's amazing how you can get groups of people who want to get better at this stuff together to share things that they're actually inherently not very good at or they're just experimenting with. So it's about creating the right sort of space and time for it to happen. I think. Yep. And there is that sense. We've got jams happening all over now. And there is that sense that it doesn't have to be perfect, that, you know, we can, we can as Google do, we can fail fast and iterate. So that sense of making those mistakes is fine. Let's take one more. Hi, I've got the microphone up yep. here. Can you see me? Got you. So I'm Bob Clark. Um, immediacy. I'm an archaeologist by trade, amongst other things. Um, social media is fantastic for things like that because, of course, the moment something's discovered on site, it whips around the network. You know, opinions come in from universities and all sorts of places like that. So we're identifying pottery, barns, and such like <coughs> at a speed which was, as you would imagine, snail pace yeah. beforehand with post-excavation. So, so for us, all of those are put working perfectly now, mm. really are. That is a brilliant example, because uh, you wouldn't typically expect archaeologists to be kind of high on social no, media. No, <laughs> no offense, man. <laughs> what I have learned through social media is that they all eat marmite. <laughs> I don't know if that's something to do with the wages. <laughs> well, we could, we could have a longer conversation, but I'm conscious of the time. Um, so let's, let's move into what are the implications now for the way that we're going to learn. And I think there are kind of three significant implications. The first is, in my view, going open is irreversible. Um, secrets are now impossible to keep. Corporations can't keep secrets anymore. Uh, and that we've now got so much control over the way that we live our lives, we're not likely to hand that back. It would have to be taken from us. I think the second thing is that going open is starting to subvert the process of knowledge exploitation. Hmm. That we, it used to be that you would need to know the value of the knowledge that you discovered and its application before you went public with it. But now, as Claire Shirky's described, you find out the value of it by going public with the knowledge and you find out the application and Google are a brilliant example of that. And the third thing, and this is very significant, I think, for your work, is that the answer isn't in anyone's head anymore. It's not even just in the room. The answer's probably in the network. And we're seeing examples now where our closest collaborators are just as likely to be on the other side of the world as they are on the other side of the staff room. So I think there are some significant implications in the way that we learn. What I did in the book was I looked at companies that you could rank high on all three areas of engagement, innovation, and productivity. And what I found from some of them, and they're, they're, they're not all kind of modern whizzy high tech ones. I looked at companies like WD40, one of the most profitable companies in the world. Um, I looked back at Thomas Edison and his inventions factory at, at Menlo Park. But what I found was that at the heart of all of this was an open learning environment. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, I, I want to finish up with this really, is that there are kind of, I think, five characteristics of open learning environment. And I just want to share with them with you before finishing. The first is that in open learning environments, hierarchies and silos are replaced by what Thomas Edison used to call a machine shop culture. Thomas Edison had, uh, all kinds of disciplines working in one space and made sure that that was deliberately the case because he wanted knowledge to move across those kinds of disciplines. The idea that Thomas Edison was this sole genius is a myth. In fact, it seems to me he was the first CLO, Thomas Edison. He was brilliant at creating the right kind of learning environment. And this uh, machine shop culture has been replicated by companies like 3M who have often said that they've got biologists, physicists, they've got all kinds of scientists and accountants and marketing people all within 50 yards of each other. So the idea of an open learning environment means getting rid of those silos and those hierarchies. But it also means welcoming unorthodoxy and diversity. You, you probably can't read this. This is from the Valve uh, staff handbook. Valve are probably the most successful uh, video games people in the world. 
And when a new person starts to work at Valve, they're given this handbook. I would strongly recommend you download it. It's funny, it's counterintuitive, because what happens at Valve is you start work and you choose the project that you want to work on. There is no, there's no bosses, absolutely no hierarchy. And they say, step one, come up with a bright idea. Step two, tell a coworker about it. Step three, work on it together. Step four, ship it. And it's as simple as that. But of course, with that freedom comes a great deal of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't find anything that you're engaged by and passionate about, and you haven't got a project of your own, then you're not going to fit into the company. But that kind of unorthodoxy about what they've done is turn conventional thinking on its head has generated um, billions of dollars profit for Valve. So unorthodoxy and diversity. Third one, in these great open learning environments, you see a lot of learning by tinkering and the learning social, and it's what I would call horizontal. So it's what Marcia Connor calls, it's learning in the moment of need, just in time learning. Thomas Edison um, used to have these all weekend kind of hackathons where they'd just invent for the whole weekend. So it was a bit like what Mark Zuckerberg did at Facebook. But instead of providing pizza, Thomas Edison used to provide beer, which you can't see in this photograph. And you can see there's a, an organ at the back. He brought in an organ on the second floor so they could have a sing song when they got drunk. And he knew that people were gonna have to work all weekend, but what he did, he opened it up to the public. So at any point, People from the public could come in and ask what they were working on. So it was a highly social kind of form of invention. You can't quite imagine that happening in Apple, inviting members of the public to come in and see what they're doing. <laughs> but this was what he believed was the best way to get people motivated as learners. Um, so that's the third one, learning by tinkering. What goes closely with that is that learners have freedom to roam. Now, at 3M, they invented that 15% free time in 1948, way before Google brought in their 20% free time. And people probably know the story of the, the invention of the post-it note. It actually came about as a result of two separate episodes of using free time. So Spencer Silver on the right, he wanted to come up with a glue which wouldn't uh, leave an adhesive. Um, and the trouble was it didn't actually stick to anything. But he used his free time to do that, and it didn't matter that it wasn't uh, successful. It just lay around for about five years till Art Fry took his free time and thought, what happened if you put this non-adhesive glue onto the back of a paper? He was actually in church, and he was creating a kind of hymnal marker. But that stuck around for a while, and, it, and if it hadn't been for the use of two lots of free time to allow those learners freedom to follow their interests and passions, then the idea that I say generated a billion others, the post-it note, wouldn't have happened. Does anybody have a post-it note in, in the room? I've got a very small one. Have you? Yeah. Can you just, because I'm just gonna share with you yeah. something that I learned about post-it notes. <laughs> post You're among friends, post Don. Post-it note. Actually, having said that, I'm not sure I, I'm the... Nobody got a part of them? It's so small, I don't know where it is, Denise. You've got one. Just there throw it up. Whoa, almost made it too. Here's the thing. Did you know that there's a correct and an incorrect way to peel off a post-it note? Somebody did. That's amazing. If you peel it off left to right, and then you stick it up and share your idea... It lies flat. If you take it up bottom to the top and you put it up, it flaps up like that. Who knew? <laughs> Why don't post-it notes come with a manual? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so there's the, the fourth characteristic. And here's the, the final one. I've lost the clicker. I'll put it down somewhere. Um, which, is the, which goes closely to that story about 3M. And it's that freedom to fail. This quote on the left, uh, if you have a work culture where bringing your mistakes to the table every week is a normal thing to do, it feels less like failing and more like learning. Uh, it's from Alan Noble from Google, Director of Engineering. The guy on the right is Gary Ridge, who when he took over at WD-40, he said that people were terrified of, about admitting to making mistakes. So he actually found that he had to ban the word fail. And he talks about learning moments now. 
And it's a subtle but important shift. And he had to incentivize people to share their learning moments. And having that freedom to fail, of course, it goes right to the heart of Thomas Edison's philosophy where he said, I haven't failed yet, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> so I think they are the, it seems to me, the five kind of key characteristics. Um, I think what all of this means is that in learning theory terms, we are moving from pedagogy to andragogy to hortagogy. Now, why are the three ugliest words in the English <laughs> language reserved for learning? I think it's those academics. They don't really want us to talk about it. But what I mean by hortagogy is a kind of self-determined learning. Um, we've gone through self-directed, and I think what we need now are learners to be setting their own course and finding their own way to get there. Um, what this means for you guys and people who learn, uh, who lead learning, is quite a subtle shift, I think. We've got to move away from the kind of dead poet society f version of leadership to encourage something a bit more like this. <laughs> a dog taking itself for a walk. <laughs> but I think we're at the point now where we have the tools, we've reconnected with some of those values, we're at the point where we can actually realize the World Wide Web's original motto, which was, let's share what we know. I think it's so cute that the World Wide Web had a logo once, <laughs> even if it was clearly designed by an academic. <laughs> but we are at the point where I think we can share what we know. And critically, I think what we're seeing in terms of knowledge and our approach to knowledge is that it's no longer being seen as a kind of finite resource. You know, the days of talking about intellectual property that has to be closely guarded, I think, are at least on the wane. Because knowledge isn't a finite resource. It's not like an apple. If I take a bite out of that apple, that's a bite that you can't have. As Thomas Jefferson said, it's more like a candle. That knowledge, if I pass it to you, I don't lose that knowledge. It's shared, and as he says, it can be spread from one another around the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and women, Thomas. <laughs> um, so we are at this point, and I think it's incredible to see because what it means uh, is that a kid from a remote village in India can have the same kinds of life chances as a middle-class kid in Southern California. But I'd also suggest that what it also means is that in terms of our businesses, it may well make the difference between those that don't survive and those that thrive. So thanks very much for listening, and if we've got time, we can have some questions, but if not, I'll speak to you later. Brilliant. Thank you. There was one question I picked up on the Twitter stream. I always sort of tried to multitask as these things are going on, or at least to rapidly switch tasks. The fast pace of social needs us to keep learning, but the question was thrown up. Where does that leave reflection? Those moments you need to sit back, think about things so that you can synthesize and pull things together. How does that fit with this thesis of speed? Yeah, and I think that's a great question. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I struggle to read a book these days. I'm so used to getting this stuff coming through Google and in these tiny, tiny chunks. So I think we need to, as uh, uh, as people who are responsible for learning, we need to recognize the importance of that reflection, the importance of returning back to concepts. There's a great book that I can recommend uh, Sherry Turkle wrote called Alone Together, where she talks about just this issue, that you know we are, we are learning at such a speed now that it's hard for us to be able to process everything. But I do believe it happens. I just think it often happens when we are in that downtime. And we've got to make sure that we've got some of that downtime. Making sure you've got downtime is so important. So I don't have my phone or my iPad in my bedroom and I have stopped automatically picking it up when I'm going to have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. And I just give myself time to not think about anything, which is a bit of a strange thing to do. And then suddenly you find, actually, yes, you're not aware of it, but your downtime, things are happening, even yep. if you're not consciously doing it. Yep. Any one last question for David before we go to our coffee break? hand shoots in the air. Would you like to spend some time just me thinking about how this could be applied to international development and how we might use some of the thinking to improve the way we learn more about reducing poverty and inequality? Wow, that's an invitation that you could not turn down. <laughs> I mean, if, what would have happened if I'd said no? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you would not have made it out of the room alive, yeah. let's be honest. But seriously, that is, that's something that I'm passionate about. Yep. Fantastic. Great. Well, look, I tell you what, we've all learned something. We've made the world not a better place yet, but we're on the way to getting there, and we've been inspired by a great talk. This has really hit a lot of um, buttons for me. I'm still thinking about what we had today when we talked last night. I'm now thinking even more. I'm going to have to make some reflective time to catch up with myself. David Price, thank you very much. Thank you.